Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's guest moderator, Jordan Hoffman, and tonight's guests, Roman Coppola and Jason Schwartzman. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys for coming. It's so nice. Big turnout. It's Big great. turnout. And everybody out there listening in iPodville, thank you for downloading or streaming, whichever you choose to do, whichever, however way you swing. Uh, my name is Jordan Hoffman. I'm a film critic at film.com. And to my left is Roman Coppola, who is the writer and director of this new movie that we just saw the trailer for. And to his left is Jason Schwartzman, who has a wonderful supporting role in this. And um, it's a hell of a great way to start the year for them with this new film, but also must congratulate you both on last year for being involved in, I, I, I don't know if it's my number one movie of the year or tied for first place, but let's just say my favorite movie of last year, Moonrise Kingdom, you. which you co-wrote. And you show me up at the end and with some of the funniest scenes. And um, Thank you. it's a hell of a movie. And you all should, should watch that immediately. Yeah. It's very, very good. OK, well, this new movie is very entertaining as well. And when I was watching it the other day, it took me about eh, 15 minutes or so when I said, hey, when the hell is this movie set? And I then realized that it is set in the 1970s, I would imagine. But it didn't. I didn't notice that at first because it's so, um, the design is so extravagant and it's so much fun. And it wasn't until I noticed, oh, there's nobody has an iPhone. And in, it wasn't the hospital scene when I realized that the stuff. So, can we talk a little bit about, um, before we get into the psychological stuff about the movie, just about the, the production design and the um, level of exuberance that is in, in this film? Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, in the past, I was kind of cagey about speaking to what time it's set in. I'd say, well, it's, we're not sure, it's not important. Uh, and so I continue to be a little pushed back because I don't want to define it so much, but it has its spiritual setting in the 70s. And it is a you know, story that's kind of set in that time in an emotional way, but not necessarily literal. Because uh, I didn't want it to feel like a period piece. It's not about that. But you know, there are a lot of movies dur made during the 70s that were inspiring to me. And, and so the very beginnings of the, the imagery of the movie were kind of steeped in that time. And there's a very famous ad for Maxell tape where there's the guy sitting in a Corbusier chair. It's known, known as Blown Away, sure. Maxell. And it's a cool guy. And uh, the speakers are blasting. And I thought, what if that guy was going through a devastating breakup? <laughs> what would happen? And so that was sort of a... A little do, kernel do, of the do, beginning. Do you know who designed that ad campaign? Is that a specific? You know, I wish I could just rattle it off. I, I don't honestly know. Okay. Um, because uh, I know that the film is called uh, Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III, and there, there is a designer named Charles White III, um, which I imagine is not a coincidence. But. It's not. He's um, a very uh, uh, important person in the West Coast uh, graphic design world. Um, in the mid-70s, there's a whole airbrush movement, a lot of incredible pop art that appeared on album covers and ad campaigns. And uh, Charles White III, uh, Peter Palombi, Dave Willardson, uh, Michael Salisbury, these are all the giants of that genre. And I'm very inspired by their work. And I wanted this movie to have a feel of their work, which is very sexy, very pop, very playful, and uh, you know, kind of has a lot of pizzazz. The, the thing that struck me was uh, it's it set, the main character played by uh, Charlie Sheen is a um, graphic designer going through a life crisis, um, sort of a very 70s life crisis in that he's got too many women, women troubles as they had back then, so I'm told. And um, the, the film takes a, a lot of stretches into imagination in sort of an eight and a half or a Billy Liar sort of way. And um, his best friend, played by Mr. Schwartzman, uh, factors into that uh, quite a bit. His best friend is, at first you think that he's, at first I thought you were like a rock star, but you're actually a comedian. But in the 70s, comedians were like rock stars in a way. So can you talk a little bit about about preparing uh, for that? Yeah, well, um, yeah, my character's name is Kirby Starr, and I am a stand-up, but um, like you say, I do think that he's like just a larger-than-life, probably very successful star, maybe you know, has many comedy records, goes on tour, probably is in a movie or two. Um, and, you know, he's also probably, you know, a social social butterfly. Um, and um, it was wonderful preparing for it. You know, first you have to start growing your beard. 
um, which Roman asked if I would do, and anything for Roman, um, except I didn't want I, 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 to, well, there was discussion about perming my hair, but it seemed uh, like it wasn't going to work. Um, I have very straight hair, and it seemed like it would be almost actually be impossible to perm it, and then it would, and we'd end up with something a bit more like 18th century composer or something. Um, but um, it was wonderful, and uh, uh, preparing for it, it was, uh, you know, I, we, Roman and I began over the years, like, you know, he's been writing this for many, many years, as well as other things, but um, working on this, and I would get little snacks, you know, over the years, like, oh, I have this idea about Kirby, and that he'll be a cowboy, and then this idea that he's dressed as Carmen Miranda, just these kind of wild <laughs> ideas, and so you're hearing all this stuff and beginning to sort of piece together this character based on these you know, nuggets I was getting, and um, the visually, like, he was giving me, like, photos of David Geffen in the 70s, and um, just incredible, and also a bunch of anonymous people, but uh, a lot of the also um, feeling of the character came from a, a wonderful documentary um, that I saw, I, I'm not sure if it's called America Boy or America's Boy, but it's um, by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, it's, a, it's American Boy, Stephen well, Prince, yeah. That was the that was the third one, <laughs> but I didn't say. And it's yeah. a hell of a film, also. Yeah, it's a great movie, and it's uh, Martin Scorsese is interviewing this um, this very fascinating man. But in the interview, you see him. It's just his vibe, and I hate the word vibe, and but I'm going to use it, and I just did. But his vibe is um, yeah, very um, intense, and he's a very active listener, and um, that was Kirby Star in a lot of ways, and that's what, that was her Roman's. Uh, he said, watch that, and maybe we, that's where he comes from. So that was sort of the vibe. That's really cool. There's a bit in the, in the film, there's like a flashback within a flashback, um, where we see you on stage. Yeah. And, and you're like riffing and you're doing your thing, and it's, it's going to set up the clip that we're going to watch in a little bit. But it's uh, very funny. Remi I mean, I have to ask, was, it reminded me a lot of, not of Bob Fosse's Lenny, but of Bob Fosse's version of Lenny within... All That Jazz, if anybody knows what the hell oh, I'm talking yeah. about. There's a movie, All That Jazz, that Bob Fosse made about his life, and in that part of his life, he was making the movie Lenny with Dustin Hoffman about Lenny Bruce. And I got it, was that a direct thing? or? Yeah, I mean, that, I love All That Jazz. It's one of my top, top favorite movies. And this movie has a humble aspiration to be to rub against it in a, some way, because I love that movie so much. So whatever I could steal from that and get away with, I, I did. Homage, homage, yeah. not steal homage. Exactly. <laughs> And not rub against. <laughs> just stand next to it. Yeah, okay. Sit, Proudly. Just, yeah, stand Proudly. next to it and have, yeah, yeah, have a nice conversation. So um, in part, so Charlie Sheen's character is going through a life crisis. He's in the hospital. He's schmoozing with his friend. They're talking about his new comedy record. And this leads in a sort of a synaptic burst way to this fantasy sequence, which we're about to see, which is the scene all about, um, well, we'll just take a look. Why don't we take it from there? Yeah, that was good. You're, that was, thank you. That was amazing. Um, I gotta say, I don't know if you could hear in that scene, but uh, Bill Murray like uh, gives me some bullets. He says, who wants popcorn? And uh, it's just one of the greatest moments of my life. Because uh, that was uh, just unscripted. And um, uh, that are, was just, that's, are, that's are, the thing about that guy. He says things that are, uh, I mean, that's, and then later I was like, on the way home, I was like, is popcorn a phrase for bullets that I've never heard? <laughs> like, I was like going way into it, like totally like spiraling into the meaning of popcorn. But it's just like the greatest thing in the world. And every time I see it, it says, who wants popcorn? Uh, just makes me, makes me so happy. So you're not sick of Bill Murray because you've worked with him about 400,000 times by now, I think, correct? I'm not. Uh, I, could nev I, could, I could never be sick of um, Bill Murray. He's the greatest and... Uh, I'm, I can't even, you know, I'm just honored that I've even gotten to work with him once and, you know, rub up against him. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about this, because he's, he's a supporting role. Um, he plays uh, Charlie Sheen's business manager. He comes in for a couple of key, very funny scenes. So obviously he wasn't on set every day. Um, is a special vibe when he shows up? I mean, not to kiss his ass too much. He's not in the room, so. But, you know, he shows up that day. How is that different? Tuesday is no Bill Murray, Wednesday is Bill Murray. How is that day different? Well, it's, you know, he has such a vitality and, you know, he's so iconic. And when he comes on the set, uh, you just feel it. He's a, he just has a, such an epic personality and sense of playfulness. And 
uh, it was just a thrill. I mean, to see him in the costumes, it just, you know, as a writer, you daydream and fantasize, like, wow, if I could get him to do it, it'd be so great. And then when he's really there wearing the outfit, uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful feeling. And um, uh, his physicality, his uh, stature, he's a big man, and he walks in a room, and it's just like, whoa, you know, there, there he is, and it's, it's always uh, it's a thrill. And every time they yell action, and by they, I mean Roman. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I said they, but every time they yell action, uh, it's always uh, exciting. You don't ever know what's going to happen, and he's, uh, he's one of the greatest in the world. He, he does a funny bit of business in this movie where he's on a hospital bed, and for whatever reason, he just like, leans over and starts talking to the pillow. And I remember watching and saying, that's the type of shit that Bill Murray does that nobody else does. Yeah. And was that in the script? Was that something you talked about beforehand? Was that something he just did during take three, and that was the one that stayed? How did that? Uh... He totally invented that, and that's the, you know, uh, people ask, oh, what's different from the screenplay to the actual film? And, and um, in many, in most ways, you know, when you imagine, when you're writing something, you imagine a, a, a location or whatever, what you were able to actually get is a little less than you had dreamt about in your writing. Um, so you always kind of make do with the best you can to get as close as you can. But with the performing and the actors, when Bill Murray comes on the set and starts reading the lines and doing stuff, it's always so much greater and such a thrill to see it come to life in that way. So that's really the, the joy of making a movie. It's always much more and much better. And he cooked that up. And uh, you know, you work together, and he does a little something. And it's like, oh, I love that. So oh, you like it? OK, let's do it. And you, you work together and find those things. Well, we're talking about the cast here, and obviously the, the, the spine of the film is Charlie Sheen, and uh, even for those of us who never pick up a copy of People magazine, we know that last year was a difficult year for Charlie Sheen. He had a, his non-film life got out there and everybody knew what was going on. And this was the year you decided to make a movie about a guy who's having a mental breakdown and has uh, 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 certainly something that could not have gone unnoticed on set. There's one scene in particular, which is hilarious where he goes on like a binge drinking maniacal night that also includes just chugging a, a, a bucket of beluga caviar which is one of the funnier things you'll, <laughs> you'll see him in the backseat with beluga caviar very funny so obviously this is all something that you're going to be talking about you know that you're addressing this head on but what was that like you know, working on that. Well, you know, people are curious about that because the character is a very, uh, you know, larger than life, charming, handsome womanizer, and so Charlie has those qualities. And you know, it's always great when a an actor embodies a role and brings so much of themselves to it. So in many ways, uh, Charlie really embodies the role. In many ways, the character is quite different. Um, and um, you know we're inventing something together, so it really isn't a portrayal of Charlie by any means. But he sure was a great guy to play the role, and just a little, you know, people are sort of curious. I, I knew Charlie as a kid uh, during Apocalypse Now. We were boys together, and we were you know pals at 12 years old, and would hang out on the set. And and um, when you have a friendship with someone when you're 12 years old, even if you never s don't see him for 10, 15, 20 years at a stretch, you have that connection. And then we had that. And when I wrote the script, and I was finishing it up, I happened to speak with him, and it had been many, many years, and he said, oh, we got to do something together, and it triggered that thought, wow, this would be the great thing for us to do together. So I didn't write it with him in mind, and um, but then I approached him, then all the craziness happened, and I was very dogged about my wish to work with him and my wish to see him back on the big screen with a real role he could sink his teeth into, and and um, it was quite difficult, to be honest, because a lot of people were discouraged, uh, dis tried to discourage me about working with him because of his profile and whatnot. But I, I was very persistent, and I think my persistence uh, impressed Charlie in some way where he felt like, geez, if this guy believes in me, it's something worth doing. So at the tail end of all that stuff, he really jumped aboard. And when he did, he couldn't have been more committed, serious, together, uh, and, and, and professional. So. My experience was the highest level of professionalism and skill as a, a fine actor. Cool, cool. I got to ask, you're f four, 12, you said 12 years old, 14 years old, hanging out in the Philippines on the set of, what was, <laughs> they, do you have any memories of the two of you guys hanging out, playing kickball in the middle while your parents are making? With heads. <laughs> no, I do. I mean, it's, it's so extraordinary looking back, but when you're a kid, it's very, normal we did one of my hobbies was uh, theatrical makeup so i would do scars and bullet wounds and that was something i introduced him to and you know it's an unusual 
uh, life, I remember you know, asking my mom if I could stay home from school so I could watch the napalm explosion and stuff. So uh, you know, those, it's just an odd way to grow up, but fun memories. Ain't that the truth. Uh, cool. Uh, well, in a little bit, we'll have time to take some questions from the, uh, from the crowd here. Um, but before we do, um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit. We're at the Apple Store, so we can dig deep a little bit about the technology here. Uh, this is a movie shot on video, but I, uh, we were talking before that I, I know that you uh, uh, made an express decision to use um, styles of lenses that, that were around more during the 70s than they're used now, a special kind of uh, dolly or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about your decision to do that and how that works with the modern technology of the current video cameras? Right. Well, it was a very good fit. You know, we used the Alexa, which is a video camera, but it's a, you know, very highly accepted as a wonderful, very film-like image. Uh, I, you know, we made this movie in, uh, in 24 days. It was not a big budget by any means, and so I had to reach out and grab and use the things that were at hand, and it so happened that the lenses my dad used on Rumblefish uh, were something that we had. So I said, well, I'll use those lenses, and they're Zeiss Super Speeds uh, 1.3 uh, T-stop, and so with the speed of the Alexa and the speed of those lenses, it really helped to um, uh, allow for fewer lights uh, that were not required. Uh, I'm a big fan of of um, the tools that you use being part of your, it's like a palette, you know, your brushes or whatever if you're a painter. And so uh, there's a dolly that I've always admired because it looks cool. It's called an Elamax spider dolly. I bought it on eBay for 3,500 bucks. I could have rented a regular dolly for that much a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very distinctive tool that uh, has a center post and allows the operator to uh, go 360 around the center post. So the shot in the hospital room with Bill Murray mm -hmm. is a one take shot in a very tight space that couldn't have happened with any other dolly except for that one. So you're talking about the th you rig up tracks and you're just pulling you th this thing and it has a, a way of moving around that the ones that are made today they simply don't do anymore. Well, uh, most contemporary dollies that are used have a, a post on one side or the other so it lifts with an arm and to, to circle around the lens is rather difficult. You have to step around off the dolly and back on or have some planks. This is a, another type of dolly. It's a more European style where there's a center post. Uh, but it's, I don't want to go off. It's not so exotic, but it's a tool that was commonly used in the 60s and 70s, especially in Europe. And I thought it's, it was kind of a joke. We arrived on the set, no one knew how to work it. But it, it excited me because it was just a tool that uh, that um, gave a distinctive flair. It, it's also neat because it reminds me of your previous film, CQ, also, which was set in Europe, and it was about the film. So you really are into that. That's no joke. That's, your, that's the thing that you are really into. That's your... Very much so. Yeah. Well, apart from being a creative writer and director, like Roman is really a, has a gift for te technology, and uh, when he was talking about... Uh, or just technology and engineering and the way things work and like the, you, you know some have bullet wounds and stuff. He also um, y you know he's an inventor and is also incredibly uh, adept at doing in camera effects. Like in this film, for instance, there's no CGI and the budget was you know not a uh, very big budget. So, but it's a very ambitious movie. So a lot of the things are all from Roman's uh, bag of tricks, uh, employing actually a lot of things that are, you know, old, like from the 30s and 40s, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, and doesn't the dolly go, can it go, when it's moving, it, if it has to go in a tight space, can it go and then like go through something small and go down? The wheels can collapse so it can get through various tight spaces, unlike any other dolly. We should do an ad for that. Well, well, uh, Jesus. While, while I'm at, well, no, I find this fascinating. If nobody else does, who cares? But I, I what, I, what is photo bubble? This is something that you that you invented. This is an invention. You, the, you guy invented the photo bubble. This is the guy yeah. that invented the photo bubble. Should we just leave that? Don't even want to know what it is. Just know that he invented the photo bubble. It's I think amazing. That's, it's hard. I, I hesitate to really call it a, an invention. It's just a novel application of something. That's, that's the been first around. thing a real inventor always <laughs> says. Um, that's but how you know he's the real thing. Uh, in short, I had a commercial production. We need to shoot a car in a huge white space with no reflections in the car. So it was a puzzle. How do you light it or have a space where there's no white? So we could paint all the walls, paint the ceiling, paint the whites, the, the lights white. It was not possible. So instead, we had this huge kind of plastic membrane that we inflated with air, and we lit it all from the outside. So it was basically a big 
a photographic enclosure uh, where the car drove around 50 miles an hour in this huge hangar uh, in this bubble. And it turned out to be so useful that we now have a little business uh, nice. making them for people. A Andy, Pat did a magic trick. <laughs> he did. Is that so? That's actually not true. I patented a, another sort of tripod idea, but I've made a magic trick. No patent on that one. But don't you have a match trick I could buy? Yes. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get into the legalities of it, but that's what my, you know. Jason, what is, the, what is his magic trick? He's Ta too shy. Tell moment. Yeah? It's called Ghost Card. It's called it's Ghost just Card. A, a, a novelty. <laughs> uh, it was just a, you know, it's nothing so spectacular, but, but it's a magic trick that, that occurred to me, that. and I fabricated a bunch of them, and we, you know, we sold them online. My point is that Roman can do everything, and he's right. an incredible man. And well, it is interesting. And you know, we were going to get to that in the clip, but I was going to bring this up. So you, I mentioned the film CQ, and if you haven't seen it, the minute you leave, go home and, and rent CQ. It's fabulous. It came out in 2001, and you have not directed a film since. Now, clearly you aren't just sitting home twiddling your thumbs. You're inventing photo bubbles and co-writing scripts with Wes Anderson and um, making um, TV commercials and whatnot. But you also um, have a lot of credits as a second unit director. And this is something that everybody's too embarrassed to ask, so I'm going to ask you, what really does a second unit director do? Uh, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's basically a, a helper to the director. A lot of times you... Um, have all you know? You have a big production, all these resources, and you need an additional shot. Uh, often, what defines a second unit director is a shot that doesn't include a star actor. So it's often a, a, a lesser supporting actor or a, a double that's replacing the actor. Some directors have a more broader view of it. And when I, when I worked with my dad on Bram Stoker's Dracula, I in fact shot uh, with all the lead actors. So he was more expansive. But it's basically a an ally to the director to help get additional pieces of film uh, because it's so expensive and time is so precious that sometimes to have another group off to the side getting a close-up or some other little extra piece is very invaluable. Did you have a second unit director on this film? Um, say no. If the answer is no, say no. The answer is no, but I just am trying to think <laughs> if there was some shot that I might have asked someone to help get help with, but uh, I, there was not. We, were, we had to move very quickly and... Uh, I got it was you. not. Cool. Okay, well, listen, let's take a look then, and then we'll get to some questions from the, uh, from the audience. But this is a scene that comes... It's funny, when you think about this movie, a lot of it is fractured in sort of an Annie Hall, eight-and-a-half kind of way, so I don't even know where this is chronologically, but it is another moment where Charlie Sheen's character and Jason's character are talking about the problems in their lives, and they have a fantasy sequence that goes to this bit of weirdness here. Well, there you go. Th there's also a toucan in this movie. There is. <laughs> I happen to love toucans. So when he, me he mentions a toucan, and then you go, oh, am I, I going to see a toucan? And then Charlie Sheen's playing with a toucan. How, why, the, you could have been a macaw. Why was it a toucan? You know, the movie is sort of a, obviously a f fantasy, and there's a lot of playfulness, and I've always thought toucans are so beautiful, and... So I thought he should, if he was going to have a pet, he would have a toucan. That's fantastic. Well, listen, we're going to take some questions from the audience. So um, we have a guy, we have a, a, probably more than one who has uh, microphones. But before we do, I have one last question, um, and then we'll, we'll throw it out. And I just wanted to bring this up. Um, for those who don't know, again, for those who don't read People magazine, Jason and Roman are cousins. I don't know that this is common knowledge or not, but they are. So they are a part of the same extended family. And uh, the Coppola family tree has got not only just actors and directors and scholars and doctors, um, but also one of my, somebody who means a lot to me personally and probably a lot to anybody from the New York area who grew up listening to classic rock. And this is your cousin Mark. Now The Cope. The Cope. Oh. For people who are here in the audience or out there in iPad, iPod uh, land, or what are they called? Uh, stream land, whatever you call it. Um, podcast land, thank you. I learned everything I know about Led Zeppelin, Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd from your cousin Mark. And he tells great stories about classic rock. And I love the guy. I got to know, what, what was it like him being a member of your family? And did he play records for you when you guys were kids? Definitely. He's a big part of my life. He was always much older. He's uh, maybe seven or eight years older than I am, or s at least six. And so he had the driver's license, and he would take us to the you know, 7-Eleven or whatever. 
Um, but he's been a wonderful influence. He um, would play rock and roll. He gave me all sorts of records as a kid. We played Monopoly. He's a big part of our family life. You're, you're in a band, well, too. I was going to say, so, well, yeah. I remember when I was uh, young, I came, I was in New York with my mom, and uh, he called the hotel or something, and we were talking, and uh, he said, do you, do you want to be on the radio? And I was like, oh, yes, I can't. Well, we can't. And he's like, okay, hold on. And you could hear him doing like a, Ninety three point one is the quote and that was uh, Pink Floyd with "Wish You Were Here." And then uh, he had a whole thing where he like requests. He uh, he told me before he's like, you know, what do you want to hear? Maybe he asked for he a he told me he I think he told me to ask for Jimi Hendrix. So it wasn't like a real r request. Sure. But it was. But it felt like so. I was like, yeah, this is Jason, and can I hear? Hey, hey, Joe. <laughs> and uh, and it was uh, and I was on the radio at like age nine. And it was uh, such a thrill. That's fantastic. It was the coolest. I mean, I was like, he is the coolest man. The Cope has been doing classic rock for a zillion years. I mean, and if you get in a cab later, you're going to hear the Cope uh, with Jimi Hendrix. Hey Joe. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. He's a, a legend in New York he and. Is. Uh, and the cool, I know your family is very cool. His voice appears in the movie. Oh, really? He's an announcer at the Best Bullshit Awards. So oh, it's just a little cameo. I was going to say, you got a cool family. He's actually the coolest guy in your family. He is. <laughs> yeah, he also uh, has iguanas, pet iguanas. I don't know if he still does, but he did. And I remember as a little kid, too, just being like, this is who are you? You know, I grew up in L.A. He's New York. So we'd come visit him, and I have this cousin who's older who's got these iguanas and Fender Stratocaster and just like... He's a rebel. He's That's a wild cool. man. I love that guy. That's awesome. Okay, so let's uh, kick it out to the audience. Hi. Um, Hi. I just wanted to ask, because you both have dealt in movies with gender roles, so I'm curious the influence of gender roles in this movie as Charlie Sheen's character is asked, oh, are you a man? What is the importance of the feminine versus the masculine in your movies? Um, the, this is a, a story of a, a breakup uh, it's a character study of uh, Charlie's character, and he's trying to uh, come to terms with this breakup. So it's a uh, relationship movie told from a very distinctive point of view of this particular guy who's quite um, immature. So um, it's, it's re seen rather very much from a, a guy's point of view. Um, but hopefully, and I've shown the film, and, and women have said, oh, I really related to it. And I said, oh, wow, that's wonderful to hear because you... I don't want to be exclusive of any other experience, but I thought so often relationship movies are told from a, a woman's point of view, or that's the, the sense that you have out there, and this is a very much uh, from an a immature male's point of view. For Jason, how did you develop the voice for Ash Fox and Fantastic Mr. Fox? I will tell you that um, when, um, when Wes first approached me about being in the movie, um, the character of Ash wasn't as big of a role, and um, and uh, we we were promoting Darjeeling Limited, in fact, and um, he, we weren't sure when uh, he was going to have time to record uh, the voice. And um, we got a studio in, in London. He got a studio, and I started going and uh, doing the voice. And at first, I was trying to talk in a more high-pitched voice because my character is very little. And then it just sort of seemed like, well, well, I mean, who's to say that a stop motion fox can't just talk like this? And um, and I and Wes said he preferred it just to be more natural and just have it to be my voice and um, mixed in with you know and mi mixed in with some higher higher registers at times and definitely a lot of like grunting, higher pitch grunting and stuff. Um, and it was really fun. It was uh, I had the time of my life doing that movie too. It was amazing because Wes got all the actors together, so we all did it live. Like in animated movies, typically people are separated, and they'll record one guy a year later than another person, and it gets edited together. But we all did it live, like and on a farm. Yeah, as I say, you went to like a farmhouse in the Berkshires yeah. or something. Yeah, and, and if like if our characters are digging in the ground, we were like really digging in the ground, and there was a guy with a mic that you know like a boom mic recording us and it's a lot of it's actually found you know the actual field noise from the day so that's 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 pretty much how it happened just naturally i think hey hi um i know you um you wrote the i think you wrote the theme song for bored to death or had a big part yes. of it uh, and you have coconut records and stuff yeah. um did you have any input in the mov uh, music in this movie yes well, well, I'll, I'll take that question. 
Okay. Because uh, the composer of all the songs, except for some incidental music of action themes and whatnot, was written by Liam Hayes, also known as Plush. And uh, Jason gave me, uh, told me to get More You Becomes You, which is a plush record, which became the sort of soundtrack of that time of my life. And all this, uh, uh, the whole movie was written over a group of years to exclusively to Liam Hayes' music. So if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have heard that and I wouldn't have had the, the vibe of the movie. So I thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. So. And I encourage people who, who might be uh, interested or curious to check out Liam Hayes' music. He's amazing. Uh, he's a, such an incredible, yeah, incredible. Uh, artist. There's one song in, in there, and it's the scene I mentioned before when uh, Charlie Sheen's character is at his absolute nadir, and he's drinking and carousing, and he's driving around the city. And the, the, the vocals in the song... Like at first it sounds like a regular song, then like it's inten has intentional uh, uh, intentional bad notes, for lack of a better term, um, which was which is very chancy because like if you're not paying attention, you're like, wow, this guy can't sing, and then you go, oh wait, he's doing it on purpose. So uh, I thought that was very striking. Cool, yeah, I'm a huge fan of of the music that he makes, and also he's amazing. Like uh, there's a scene in the movie where I sing a, like right before the clip we just watched, I sing a little cowboy ditty, and we had to figure it out and. Literally, and he was there visiting us, and he literally wrote it like in ten minutes. He wrote it in th ten minutes, and it was the lyrics were <laughs> so good, the melody was so good. And I was just like, "Ooh, that makes me feel sick." How fa how fast that he did that. He's so talented. Um, Jason, you're obviously very successful in music and acting, but when you were growing up, did you have a priority of what you would rather do, or did you, I mean, expect to be doing both as a as a life goal? Absolutely not. Um, um, well, acting, for sure not. Um, you know, and that's just, I don't really know why. That was just more of a, uh, well, uh, let me just first say, uh, music was what I, when I was very young, I just, I loved music deeply, and I loved, you know, MTV. I, I would watch a lot of MTV when I was young, and I wanted to be in a band. I would see bands on MTV. I always thought bands were the, the coolest and I loved um, you know well this is just I'll just bear with me when I would go see movies with my family um, you know in the movie theater it would be an event on a Sunday for instance we'd all get in the car and go see a movie and it would be projected and it was like such a big deal and this is the, in the 80s it's Arnold Schwarzenegger or Mel Gibson you know huge stars huge movies so it was like this is great but I never thought like I'm gonna grow up and be one of these guys I'm gonna you know what I mean like I'm gonna blow some shit up and I just never was I didn't have that I just I loved movies and um, I would always especially comedies I would love to do the lines of the comedies on the way home but I just didn't I didn't think but music you know when I was um, nine or um, ten I got a cheap drum set and um, I love that it could it was in my home it was not like a movie, which was a big deal to go see a movie and stars. I had a drum set in my house. I had headphones. I plugged into a stereo, and you could just play and make music on your own. And um, I, I just, at an early age, I just had an obsession with um, with music. And so that was the. F and so I hoped that I could be in a band. That was my dream. I definitely knew I wasn't going to be like a uh, doing math. <laughs> I can't do, I'm terrible with other things, you know what I mean, I can't, I literally cannot do certain things, so I hoped, I put all my uh, hope in that realm. Hey Jason, what's going on? Hi, how are you? Um, I know that you played <coughs> the lead character's best friend in the film. How did you and Charlie go about uh, developing that dynamic um, to prepare for that? You know, when you talk to a director or someone, uh, as the as a, you're getting closer to making um, making a movie or a television show, um, and they tell you the cast, you get so excited. But you also there's a part of you that hopes you get along, and I don't think that getting along is a necessity, um, because that you know that would be wishful thinking. Sometimes people just don't get along for whatever, or not not aggressively not get along, but, you know, maybe just aren't into the same things and, you know, just kind of stops when, when work ends. Um, but I've been very lucky because I feel like um, I, I have gotten along with the people that I've worked with. And um, Charlie, um, from the second I met him, um, I think that we just, we did have a rapport and um, 
um, we laughed at a lot of the same things. I think humor is like really such a nice thing. That it's a quick way to bond with someone is over if you can find the same things funny and um, I, you know. And, and I think it just progressed, and we had a nice uh, we had a nice relationship. And he's fascinating to me. He's interested in so many things, and I like I'm interested in people who are interested in things. And um, you know, and he's also has a real encyclopedic um, knowledge of um, of movies, old movies, and of uh, sports. And I like sports. And so he was very. Uh, it was we had nice conversations about about that kind of stuff. So it was just. But I don't know. It was just luck. I mean, I think that's sometimes that w you know I was we were lucky that we all that we got along. Um, I don't know. Yeah. But I've I've worked with people before where just like. You say something and they don't laugh, and then they say something and you don't laugh, and they're like, "You got to see this thing," and you're thinking, "Oh, okay. I, you're saying out loud, I got, I can't wait to see it." Inside, you're saying, "I saw it, and it's the, it's terrible, uh, it's not funny, and it's not going to change my life, and neither are you." That's so refreshing to hear, because whenever you hear actors talk, it's like, "Oh, working with so and so is wonderful," and like, the "Life isn't like that." It's a guy at the office you don't like. I mean, it's a job, and yeah. then the job's over, they go their way. And you but go I there. will say, yeah. I have been very lucky, like. You know, a lot of the directors I've worked with, too, it's, I, it's not like I knew them before we were together. We met because of the work, but w I have been very lucky to develop um, real relationships with a lot of um, the people that I've worked with, and it, it's something that I truly am very thankful for because it's so hard. To, it's, like, it's like I didn't have a lot of friends in high school, and then I got them all later. It's like I stockpiled or I mean, I didn't, <laughs> like, I didn't, yeah, I didn't. Now I have, like, people that are, like, I can call best friends. Oh. Yeah. Well, whatever. <laughs> Boo hoo. How's it going, Jason? Good. How are you? Uh, what was it like working with Phantom Planet? Because I'm a big fan of them. Thank you. Yeah. It was oh, it was, the, it was great. Um, that was a band that I was in. Roman actually recorded uh, our first demo on a four track at my uh, mom's house in 1993, uh, I believe. And um, for also the first time I saw someone have chewing tobacco. Mark Fay did chewing, had chewing tobacco with spit and saying it was, just, I didn't know what that was. Um, it was so I'm used to seeing stuff come out of the soda can in his mouth. I'm not, what is he, why is he spinning it back? How is he, is he regurgitating it in pieces? It was very weird. Um, that's a disgusting side note. Um, but um, but uh, I formed the band when I was 13, 14 years old. And um, again, I mean, if you dreamt of being like in a band from the time you were really little, to finally get in a band, get songs together, play live, it was, uh, it was, you know, it, was it truly was like a dream come true. And then to go on tour and uh, make records, it was, it was incredible. Absolutely, it was totally a dream come true. And then it ended. <laughs> <laughs> and like all dreams, you wake up. I think this is the last question, so it's got to be it was the best. really good question. So if you're hesitant about your question and don't think it's going to pass muster, self-censor, because it's got to be really good. Whoa. Who's got that question? Who's got the confidence? Who's got it? This guy. Oh, yeah. He's got it. All right. Sure, no he pressure. can do it. No pressure, right? <laughs> so a question for Roman. Um, you're a graduate of NYU, right? A pretty. I didn't graduate, but I attended. You went to years, NYU. Yeah. Okay, prestigious. Well, that... It's Maybe a thought that counts, though, yeah, right? You went. It's good. But it went. sets up the question of, um, you know, from your perspective as a director, maybe even more so as a guy who runs a production company and looks at emerging talent, do you think that um, the value proposition is still there today for, like, an expensive, prestigious film school degree? Or with the costs of equipment coming down and crowdfunding, do you think it's better for those kids to, uh, you know, pass up those student loans and just start shooting and start like you know making movies i would advocate the more that's making a good the movies that was a great question version that is a great question um you know everyone has their uh what works for them so i would hate to give some advice to because every system can work but uh, the best part about nyu was sight and sound where they give you a roll of film and a little airy s and you go out and make a movie very quickly and of course now there's new tools uh but i think uh, just you know if you have a passion to make movies and tell stories to jump in there and do it at whatever level with whatever tools is t the name of the game and I don't think a degree uh, accounts for a whole lot except to you as a person and developing yourself but in terms of uh, entree it's not meaningful but to make interesting work is snap very good well listen 
Thanks very much for coming. Thank and you, guys. Can I say, so can I much. say one thing? Yes. No. I want to say I want to say thanks to our hosts here. Yes. It's very cool that Mac supports this. We didn't talk about it, but a lot of the effects that I did and the editing was all done on Mac gear, and the iPad has become a great production tool. So uh, thumbs up to Mac. And today, this film is released on iTunes. So if you're yeah. curious about it, you can go home and check it out, and uh, hopefully people will enjoy the picture. And then there will be a theatrical release in Fe cities on February 8th. February 8th at a theater near you. But if you just can't wait till February 8th, um, you can watch it on VOD right now. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you guys so much. It was awesome. Thank you again. Thank you, Thank you to That's our guests. Best.